What was actually said about the bullets found in Stephen Avery's garage in the 2005 murder of Teresa Halbach? Today on the Jim Haggerty Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our continued coverage of Convicting a Murderer, the 10 part rebuttal to the Netflix documentary, Making a Murderer, the two season project that took the true crime community by storm. Again, fair disclosure, I do have a small role in convicting a murderer. After making a murderer dropped almost eight years ago, I started investigating Stephen Avery's claim that he was framed by police for the 2005 murder of Teresa Halbach, and I reported my findings for various publications. Now, although Stephen Avery's current post-conviction attorney, Kathleen Zellner, claims a bullet found in the garage in 2006, his garage, never passed through bone, the man who prosecuted him, and Brendan Dassey says he made no such claim. Now, jumping right in, we're talking about Ken Kratz and Kathleen Zellner. What was presented at trial? What was presented in Making a Murderer? And what was actually and what, what what's actually the truth about these two bullets? But let's jump in. One of the bullets, uh, w- of course, we know was just a fragment. They were both actually there were two bullets. Both of them were actually um, presented in Making a Murderer as bullet fragments and of course Avery supporters have dubbed the bullet with Teresa Halbach's DNA on it the magic bullet and again it was found in March of 2006 after Brendan Dassey told investigators that Stephen Avery shot Teresa Halbach several times inside Avery's garage now the idea uh, that millions of making a murderer viewers had about this bullet uh, came from testimony from Wisconsin Special Agent Kevin Hemrell. You know, he told the jury, according to Making a Murderer, that he recovered a, quote, flattened bullet. And I saw what appeared to be a flattened or a flattened bullet. And I saw what appeared to be a flattened or a flattened bullet. I saw what appeared to be uh, a bullet. I recognize it as what appeared to be a nearly intact bullet. Now, this has left some, including Stephen Avery supporters, scratching their heads a bit because the special agent actually said something else. So that leaves us with a question, folks. According to Convicting a Murderer, this was just creative editing that was sprinkled throughout Making a Murderer. Regardless, droves and droves of logical fallacies continue to swirl about these bullets And this is what I found when I started reporting on this in 2016. So I reached out to some key players in the case, including former Calumet County Prosecutor Ken Kratz because of uh, what he told the jury, namely in uh, in his closing argument about this bullet. And of course, Kathleen Zellner remains right in the center of this because the claims that she made about the same issue. Of course, uh, Kratz at trial presented the bullet and testimony that it contained Teresa Halbach's DNA, and that DNA links Stephen Avery to the murder. Zellner does not dispute that fact. She claimed in a 2017 filing that the discovery of Halbach's DNA falls in line with Avery's story that officials in Manitowoc County joined Calumet County, those in the Wisconsin Department of Justice, and the real killer set him up by planting evidence. Now, let's catch everybody up to speed uh, before we get into the actual bullet conversation. We know that there's been controversy surrounding Mark Wiegert's question to Brendan Dassey. Now, this is on March 1st, 2006, and the question is about who shot Teresa Halbach in the head. All right, I'm just going to come up and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Why didn't you tell us that? Because I couldn't think of it. This uh, continues to lend to controversy because of the way Mark Wiegert asked this question and when he asked it and how Brendan Dassey answered it. However, if we look at the case file, we find out that Tom Fassbender and Mark Wiegert find out that Teresa Halbach had been shot before they brought Brendan Dassey in on March 1st, 2006. They learned that uh, the, the skull fragments found on Stephen Avery's property indicated that she had been shot in the head. 
And they tried to get Brendan Dassey to kind of come up or to kind of start talking about that by mentioning things to her head. Dassey was avoiding or just giving a variety of answers that didn't really make any sense. You know, he punched her. He cut her hair. He did, and then uh, Uyghur just comes right out and says, you know, who shot her in the head? So we're up to speed there. But let's jump into how Kathleen Zellner has laid the groundwork for the claim that this bullet was, was planted and how the DNA may have been planted um, on this bullet. Now, in Avery's 2017 petition for relief, Zellner claims, had the bullet been shot through the victim's skull, it would contain bone particles. According to experts, she paid to examine the evidence. It contains no bone, the scientists opined, only small particles of wood and a red stub substance that may be paint. Now, here's Zell Zellner's claim. This is what she wrote in her 2017, June 7, 2017 uh, petition for post-conviction relief. Quote, the state's theory that Miss Halbach's cause of death was the result of being shot in the head with a 22 caliber long rifle bullet is completely disproven by Dr. Christopher Palinick's testing. End quote. Now, presenting Kathleen Zellner's assertion to Ken Kratz, here's how he responded. Quote, because two bullets were recovered and two entrance wounds were observed in the skull does not mean that the two fragments went through the skull. Now, he, he said this referring to page 98 of his closing statement. And although only two bullet fragments were recovered, there were 11 shell casings. In other words, the actual bullet shot into Halbach's head, one in the left side and one in the back, were likely not recovered. At least one that was, however, forensically links Teresa Halbach to Avery's gun. That gun is the small caliber rifle that Brendan Dassey told police his uncle kept in his bedroom and used to shoot Teresa after they placed her on the concrete garage floor. Kratz continues, quote, I doubted the jury would be able to determine the number of times she was shot, end quote. And because the majority of Teresa Halbach's remains were destroyed by fire, the number of gunshot wounds she suffered will likely remain a mystery. Now, what can be determined is what appears in the trial transcripts, most notably what was said by Kratz himself. A claim by Kathleen Zellner to show something else, he said, represents an intentional misinterpretation of fact. Quote, she needs to be called out for her playing fast and loose with the historical record. Now, also keep in mind that Brendan Dassey told investigators that Avery shot Teresa Halbach in the torso and in the left side of the head. Now, he drew a stick figure labeled as Teresa's body, depicting the wound. Now, there's also something that we know about the gun. Now, we know the gun fired the bullet uh, containing Teresa Halbach's DNA. Because of markings on the bullet in States Exhibit 277, I was able to conclude that this bullet had been fired from this specific gun. Now, this gun technically didn't belong to Stephen Avery, but we do know that he was in possession of it. Now, we also know more about this gun. Now, this wasn't in Making a Murderer. However, in Episode 7 of Convicting a Murderer, a jail call between Avery and his father, Alan Avery, sheds more light on this gun. I'm on TV. What? I'm on TV. Now, some say that um, the revelation that uh, Stephen Avery makes that seems to perplex his father that he wiped off the gun uh, was a tell. It was a slip, which is why he changed the subject to, hey, look, I'm on TV, which he was probably referring to the news that he was watching in, in uh, the county jail. Uh, but it did throw his father off. Um, the, the calls are out there, by the way, and it did kind of throw his father off, and he, he did uh, completely change the subject there. As we know, Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are serving life sentences in Hallbach's death, Avery without parole. Dassey had initially agreed to testify against his uncle as part of a plea agreement that likely would have seen him serve about uh, between 10 and 20 years. Although that didn't happen, largely because of pressure from Avery himself, 
who some say influenced Dassey through various family members. Although he did not testify in Avery's trial, Dassey took the stand during his own, uh, telling the court he based his story about how he participated in the crime on events described in the James Patterson novel, Kiss the Girls. A jury later found him guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree sexual assault, and mutilation of a corpse. He is eligible for parole in 2048. Now, we do know that Dassey took his appeal, that he was coerced all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rejected the argument. But that is our report for today. Join us next week as Episode 8 of Convicting a Murderer drops Wednesday night at midnight Eastern time. We will have another special report when that episode drops on Daily Wire Plus. We'll see you next time.